This episode is brought to you by Choiceology, an original podcast from Charles Schwab. Hosted by Katie Milkman, an award-winning behavioral scientist and author of the best-selling book, How to Change, Choiceology is a show about psychology and economics behind our decisions. Hear true stories from Nobel laureates, authors, athletes, and more about why we do the things we do. Listen to Choiceology at schwab.com slash podcast or wherever you listen. What's one attraction you think everyone should see at least once in their life? Oh, hands down, the world's largest ball of twine. I mean, yeah. that is, that's a cultural icon. Yeah, and you have to listen to the song over and over and over again while you're driving there to annoy your children. <laughs> that's yes. part of it. They said, Dad, we want to see the biggest ball of twine in Minnesota. They pick the biggest ball of twine in Minnesota. You're listening to How To. I'm Amanda Ripley. That was Weird Al Yankovic, singing about one of our country's most famous roadside attractions. Now, why are we playing this song? Well, the other day, a listener called into the How To Hotline with an unusual request. How can our town, he wanted to know, build a truly awesome roadside attraction? One that delights and inspires. One that rivals the largest ball of twine in America. Our listener is from a little town in Delaware called Smyrna, a place you've probably never heard of, which is part of the problem. Smyrna is a small town. We are about 13,000 people, a very agriculturally focused area of our state, but it still has this wonderful little small town charm. That's Mike. He wears many hats in Smyrna. In addition to running a fleet of taco trucks, he owns a craft distillery in an old renovated movie house. He's a member of the town council and he sits on the county tourism board. So probably fair to say that Smyrna depends on Mike as much as Mike depends on Smyrna, which is why it pains him so much that so few people spend their time and their money in his cute little town. We have the unfortunate um, or fortunate, depending on your perspective sometimes, spot of being in the middle of our state. We have beaches that people travel to in massive numbers throughout the summertime. And unless you need gas, you're not likely to get off the highways. You know, back when the major toll roads, before those were built, you had to travel through a lot of these little towns, and my town being one of them. But now, you can just bypass us if you want to. But earlier this year, Mike got an idea. So this summer, I wanted to do about a two-week road trip with my kids, and we were going to go up through New England. I had done trips like this with my father when I was a kid, and we would often stop at things on the side of the road. Somebody who built the spaceship, Paul Bunyan and Babe the Big Blue Ox, the dinosaurs out in the, the desert. I wanted to break up the trip and have a little bit of fun. We visited, I think, probably about 10 or 12 of these along the way during our trip, but what I also saw was that my wonderful little state of Delaware was empty on the map. I absolutely love my state and I love my county and my town. And I got to thinking, well, why not? Like, why hasn't somebody gone out and built something like this here? Why not indeed? Why not build something engaging, enticing, simply Smyrna to lure the beachgoers off the interstate? To help Mike figure this out, we found literally the perfect person. My name is Erica Nelson, and I am the owner and operator of a roadside sideshow expo that houses the world's largest collection of the world's smallest versions of the world's largest things, which are replicas of roadside attractions from across the U.S. that build themselves as some sort of superlative, like the biggest, the largest, the smallest, the longest, the deepest, and uh, just love to talk about them. Erica spent years traveling to see hundreds of roadside attractions, and she's built a bunch of large-scale art installations herself. Now she helps towns like Smyrna who want to build their own roadside attractions. Yes, that is a real job. So on today's show, we're going to discover the magic behind the world's best roadside attractions. And we'll teach Mike how to capture that wonder. And maybe even a few tourist dollars. And don't worry, we will get back to the world's largest collection of the world's smallest versions of the world's largest things. But 
To tide you over for now, please enjoy the museum's delightful theme song. Well, I'm a traveling down the road, and what do I see but a John Deere corn and a bigger strawberry. I'm not hallucinating, and I'm not crazy, but this giant talking cow is talking to me. I'm the seller, obviously. The world's largest collection of the world's smallest version of the world's largest things. Traveling roadside attraction. How To is brought to you by Progressive. What's one thing you'd purchase with a little extra savings? A weighted blanket? Smart speaker? That new self-care trend you keep hearing about? Well, Progressive wants to make sure that you're getting what you want by helping you save money on car insurance. Drivers who save by switching to Progressive save over $700 on average, and customers can qualify for an average of six discounts when they sign up. Discounts like for having multiple vehicles on your policy. Progressive offers outstanding coverage and award-winning claim service day or night. They have customer support 24-7, 365 days a year. When you need them most, they're at their best. A little off your rate each month goes a long way. Get a quote today at Progressive.com and see why four out of five new auto customers recommend Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National annual average insurance savings by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2020 and May 2021. Potential savings will vary. Discounts vary and are not available in all states and situations. This episode is brought to you by Choiceology, an original podcast from Charles Schwab. Choiceology is a show about all the psychology and economics behind our decisions. Each episode shares the latest research in behavioral science and dives into questions like, can we learn to make smarter decisions? Or what is the power of negative thinking? The show is hosted by Katie Melkman. She's an award-winning behavioral scientist, professor at the Wharton School, and author of the best-selling book, How to Change. In each episode, Katie talks to authors, athletes, Nobel laureates, and more about why we make irrational choices and how we can make better ones. Choiceology is out now. Listen and subscribe at schwab.com slash podcast or find it wherever you listen. Erica, can you tell us a little bit about what drew you to roadside attractions in the first place? Growing up, uh, we lived in a small town, rural Missouri, but in the summers, we would travel to ever, wherever dad was stationed. He was in the Air Force, so before being able to Google things, when it was just maps and research, I thought my mom was so amazingly brilliant. How did you know that there's mm. this giant rift in the continent and you could go look at it? Mm. So that amazement that came with finding something outside of your experience, mm -hmm. to me was just magical. And the more that I grew up and started driving myself around, I realized, other people didn't navigate that way. They didn't navigate by senses of wonder. So I kept wanting to find that again. I love that idea of navigating by wonder. And that's, I think, what attraction builders want to build, too. It could be thought of as a commercial venture, but at the heart of it, at the core of it, the thing that makes people stop is that acknowledgement of an authentic feeling that is so hard to pin down. Yeah, it's almost like in a way, in modern life, we need these little surprises and quirks and delights more than ever. We live in a globalized world where, you know, you lose that sense of place and the personality of a place. Is this like an American thing? Or do all countries have roadside attractions at this level? I think it's a young country thing. So Canada mm. and Australia both have a large amount of big things and they mm. celebrate them. And I think part of that, too, is the road trip culture that we have is also so new. We don't have the historical spots to go to that a place with buildings from the 1400s or 200s does. So we sort of create these monuments as a community experience in a younger country that has not the amount of history that uh, that the rest of the world does. Right, right. You don't have a medieval cathedral, right? So maybe, you know, you can have like a, a giant nickel. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's also ego-based. I mean, Americans are giant, flamboyant, loud mm. people. So we 
build giant True. flamboyant loud things. Even before the Statue of Liberty arrived in America, there were roadside attractions. The oldest one still standing is Lucy, a six-story high wooden elephant on the Jersey Shore. Lucy was built in 1881, and even back then, she was seen as a whimsical way to bring tourists into town. Then the popularity of roadside attractions really soared with the rise of the automobile and the interstate highway system. Think of Dinosaur Gardens in Michigan, or the Corn Palace in South Dakota, and of course, the Clown Motel in the Nevada desert. I mean, there are thousands of these things, most of which you've never heard of, which is why we're trying to figure out what separates the mildly interesting attraction from the truly spectacular. Part of my question was really not just how do you build, you know, the world's largest garden gnome, um, but how do you also make it something that people want to stop and see? Right. How do you make it a thing? Mm -hmm. Right. Not just a weird, eccentric oddity. Not just an object, but an event. Yeah. Like you, kn exactly. you know from the parking lot onwards that this <laughs> is going to provide some photo ops, provide some food that you wouldn't normally otherwise get, like fudge. And that memory. So what goes beyond the object into memory? The attractions that go beyond object into memory usually have a deep sense of place, Erica says. We just couldn't really imagine them existing anywhere else but where they are. Well, and you're also placed really well in being in a smaller rural community because it does mean you have more flexibility. There's often fewer regulations. And if you ignite that spark within enough of the movers and shakers in a small town, it is so much more likely to happen with that mutual support system that's built into these communities. I think that very much resonates with the conversations that I've had. You know, that idea of what is the most Smyrna thing you can do or something like that. It, from my business, my distillery, when we were getting ready to start, we said, what is the most Delaware product we could make? And we actually make a Scrapple flavored vodka because it is the most <laughs> Delaware thing we could think awesome. of. Awesome. <laughs> that sounds simultaneously wonderful and awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And, and so I, I get that authenticity. I think that that is something that really speaks huh. to making it fit in the community. The tricky thing on my mind is that I've seen lots of things die, great ideas uh, die because of death by committee, right? You bring so many people mm. in to try and mm. find something that you'd never get to define it. And eventually folks just sort of walk away. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it could also be a trial period. Like what would happen if every year somebody else said, this is the most Smyrna thing I can think of? And you try it that year at a festival. What if it ends up being like a downtown sculpture competition, but the most Smyrna sculpture that you can do in front of your business or your storefront that's up for a year? It'd be so much more interesting than the fiberglass plunk art that happens in so many towns that have a committee decide the fiberglass thing and everybody just gets to paint it. And if that happened for five to 10 years, which sounds like a long time on this side of it, but when you look back backwards, five years isn't much, 10 years isn't much. But that'd be a way to sort of crowdsource the wonder and see which ones really fly. If our first rule is to be authentic to your place, then crowdsourcing a point of town pride is our next suggestion. Not only is it a community building exercise to help people get on board, it's also a really good way to test drive ideas. I like that. I totally agree with the not wanting to be the homogenous sort of plunk art, um, as you referred to it, of, you know, yeah, you just, everybody paints a, a cow or something. One of the other things that I considered when thinking about this is, it seems like there's a little bit of controversy might be a good thing about <laughs> a roadside attraction versus trying to find something that everyone agrees with. And nobody's ever going to agree, but this could be a way to start civil conversation again. So it could do the same amount of community building as that final thing could be. What are some of the biggest mistakes people or towns make when trying to do this? I think sometimes people don't go big enough. Like in Nederland, Colorado, they have a festival called Frozen Dead Guy Days, 
because a man cryogenically froze himself and somebody in Nederland thought, hey, this is really bizarre and unique. So let's have a festival called Frozen Dead Guy Days. <laughs> and so now they do it annually. But if it had just been a whisper of an idea, if there hadn't been somebody who goes, yes, this is amazing and bizarre and we should celebrate it in a big way, then it just kind of peters out. Hmm. Okay, so we've got two rules at least so far. One is be authentic to your place. Um, and the next sounds like it's, you know, go big or go home. Yeah. And, and like commit. <laughs> yeah. Uh, because And there are going to always be the naysayers. And I think we're so afraid of being rejected by our own town or rejected by somebody saying, oh, well, that's silly or that's ridiculous. There's, mm. Those are always going to be out there. So if you decide up front that I don't care, I know this is awesome and you go for it, <laughs> you can embrace all the people who aren't going to like it up front and go, hey, you know what? This isn't your cup of tea. You, you don't want a Scrapple flavored vodka. I get you. This isn't for you. This is for all the other people out there who are wanting to try it. Yeah, I feel like Mike, can, Mike, you can do this, right? I mean, I'm sure there are people who didn't think Scrapple vodka was a good idea. You did it anyway. Yeah, yeah. In fact, I think it was all of us didn't think it was a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and it was the world around us who told us differently. So uh, the opportunity to be wrong um, and happy about it is, uh, it is a nice thing to have. <laughs> but I really like the idea of that go big or go home sort of approach to it. Because the um, as some of the things that we have that I've seen along the way, and like the, the things that we stopped at, um, they were interesting ideas, but it just seemed like it could be so much more. But it seems like being open to those ideas is really important. Um, imagining it, that it could be way bigger than what it is. And you sort of swing for the fences right off the bat. Yeah. And if you eliminate the, well, that's not going to work because if you just take that out of the equation... And even within yourself, force the brainstorming to be positive of what would be the craziest end to this idea and seeing where you fall within that. If there were no constraints and money were not an object and you could not fail, <laughs> what would it be? Does anything come to mind? So one of the oddest things, our community has a long history of trapping and Smyrna is or was known as a place where people would go to get muskrats. And um, eating muskrat is an old tradition around here, uh, not something that I've partaken of, but there used to be restaurants in our town that served it. Right? They kind of remember <laughs> it as something that you had to do rather than something that you wanted to do. <laughs> yeah, um, but you've got muskrat love right there. Looks like muskrat love. <laughs> yeah. The song's already written, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. That's, oh, there, there's so many fun things you could do with that. I mean, what if there is a muskrat parade? What if it takes the community coming together to build the parts and pieces and see how this muskrat comes together? Oh, there's so many great things. That's true. I, it does give that opportunity to connect the past to the present, I think. And it doesn't mean that everyone has to go out and eat muskrats. The other idea, many years ago, there was a thing called the Runamuck Festival here in Smyrna. And Runamuck uh, was pig races. Like, and they would hold pig races in the downtown. But they made it a little bit of a cultural, like a day out in the community. And they would actually have a lot of like the politicians dress up in basically women's clothes, and these were typically men at the time, obviously, typically women's clothes, but also wear like pig noses and pig tails, and that they also had to have a race um, as well, along with the racing pigs. Um, <laughs> and so people remember that and talk about that as like, you know, the, the most fun thing you did in the summertime in Smyrna was you go downtown for uh, run amok. Okay, so besides the muskrat and the run amok, there's one more option, one that's already kind of a weird inside joke in Smyrna. Somebody came up with this joke on Facebook, what they call the Duck Creek Ferry. 
this is a boat that allegedly runs in the shallow creek in town. And the most important thing to know about the Duck Creek Ferry, it doesn't actually exist. I have a t-shirt that says Duck Creek Ferry <laughs> Staff that somebody was selling on Facebook. Um, somebody put a sign out uh, for 4th of July. It said like, you know, 4th of July ferry rides with an arrow. And it just points into down a road where there's nothing. Um, huh. And it has been quite entertaining in that folks, you know, will respond to a totally legitimate and honest question asked in the, like the community group with the Duck Creek Ferry. Okay. <laughs> like, like, yeah, you're, somebody's looking for, you know, a restaurant recommendation or a dentist and uh -huh. somebody follows up with <laughs> like, oh yeah, no, I get my teeth done on the Duck Creek Ferry, you know, like, <laughs> you know, the true origins of it, I'm not a hundred percent sure, but I've, I've met some of the people who have really embraced it. And then I've come across people who it absolutely infuriates. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Which is that crackle that you're talking about, right? Like a little conflict might be okay. So we've got a few zany ideas, but does Smyrna have to build the world's largest muskrat for people to care? How much does a world record actually matter? We'll find out right after the break. Creating visual content is an essential part of any business, but the creative process isn't always that easy. Like, for instance, sometimes I send a newsletter out to people who want to learn what I'm doing, and then I try and figure out, so like, where do I find the graphics or the images to put into it? I don't know which ones I have to pay for. I don't know which ones are free. How do I embed videos into emails? I, I've tried it like five times and it never works. Well, it didn't work, that is, until I found Canva Pro. Because Canva Pro makes it easy to create stunning visual content in any format, from social media posts to videos, presentations, and websites. Canva Pro takes the time and guesswork out of designing. In a single click, for instance, I was able to remove the backgrounds from an image and then resize it so that it actually made sense not only in the email I was sending out and online, but also on mobile and all the different social media channels. They call that magic resize. And I'll be honest, when I was able to hit one button and make the background disappear from the photo, my kids thought I was like a magician. Design like a pro with Canva Pro. Right now, you can get a free 45-day extended trial when you go to canva.me slash howto. That's C-A-N-V-A dot M-E slash howto for a free 45-day extended trial. Canva.me slash howto. Support for this podcast comes from WISE, the universal account made for moving money around the world. 170 countries, 50 currencies, one account. Who exactly is WISE made for? It's made for Austrians uprooting to Australia, Swedes safariing in South Africa. It's made for business in Tokyo and pleasure in Miami. With WISE, you can send, spend, or receive money internationally all in one account. It's a convenient way to move your money across borders. You'll get the mid-market exchange rate with no markups and fees that are always low and transparent. Wise Business is the only business account you need to go global. It has everything you need to grow and operate your multi-currency business without the hefty admin and headache of a local bank. Join 13 million people and businesses who are already saving. Learn more about how the Wise account could work for you at wise.com slash slate. This episode is brought to you by Welly Health, your favorite first aid brand. A lot of things can get in the way of your day. Colds, allergies, Pain? Luckily, Welly now has over-the-counter medicines and drug-free supplements to help with all of that. And it's all made with trusted, science-backed ingredients you need while avoiding the things you don't. So get the relief you need and get right back to it with Welly Medicines and Supplements. To take 15% off your purchase, use the code GETWELLY at getwelly.com. -E If you rely on how to to help you with your zany ideas, the best way to support this show is by joining Slate Plus, Slate's membership program. Members never hear another ad on our podcast or any other Slate podcast. How great is that? You also get free and total access to Slate's website. So I hope you'll join if you can. To sign up now, go to slate.com slash how to plus. Again, that's slate.com slash how to plus. Thanks. We're back with our listener, Mike, and our roadside attraction aficionado, Erica Nelson. 
Now, you might be wondering, how did Erica ever begin creating the world's largest collection of the world's smallest versions of the world's largest things? Well, for Erica, it all began in grad school when she started taking little road trips to wacky places just to find an escape. At a certain point, I was at a decision-making juncture where I could either sign a tenure track teaching position, which is what I was supposed to be building for, or I could sell everything I own and move into a bus full time. So I did the second one instead of the first. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, good for you. It, That's awesome. And because I mean, I've always figured you can always sign another piece of paper, but how often can you follow the dream that um, when you're older, it might be harder to travel or yeah. you might know more and realize that's a really bad set of decisions. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know too much. Yeah. So for two years straight, she lived in her converted bus and traveled to as many roadside attractions as possible. Eventually, she landed in Lucas, Kansas, a tiny town of 400 people where art is at the heart of the town. This is the longest I've lived anywhere, but I could hmm. purchase the house right next to a roadside attraction that was built uh, between 1907 and 1932. And it's hmm. this bizarre, amazing three-story sculptural set of uh, politics at the turn of the last century called the Garden of Eden. When someone like Erica says that something is bizarre and amazing, you got to listen. The Garden of Eden is a folk art funhouse with Dozens of sculptures and even a glass covered coffin holding the artist and his wife. If you're ever passing through Kansas on I-70, it's definitely worth a pit stop. And this turned out to be the perfect neighbor for Erica's own growing collection of oddities. And as I saw more and more world's largest, I started thinking, oh, this would be kind of funny if I just started making world's smallest of the world's largest. Yes. And then suddenly you have a collection and then mm -hmm. it just made sense to compound it into the world's largest collection of the world's smallest versions of the world's largest things. When you spoke to the Wall Street Journal a while ago, I believe you said no one expects anything out of Kansas. So that gives you a permission slip to do whatever the hell you want. Yeah. And that is also the glory of these small towns, which I was kind of referring to earlier. You can fully work through an idea and then spring it on people. And then they're like, how did that happen? Well, it took us five years and you just weren't paying attention. So, pa pow. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I guess, Mike, is it fair to say, like, people don't expect a ton out of Delaware? So that gives you a permission slip to do whatever the hell you want. Is that right? Yeah, I, I think it actually is. Um, right, being underestimated is kind of uh, an opportunity. Erica, can you think of any example of another town like Smyrna that was sort of casting about for a roadside attraction idea and then hit upon a good one? Uh, one of my favorite sets of stories is from Washington State, where there were a couple of world's largest things that kind of came together. One community, Long Beach, is known for gooey ducks, which are some pretty awful looking um, sea creatures that uh, taste good. So in their annual clam festival, it's a type of clam, they created this giant frying pan for their gooey duck festival. But before the festival, they would have all of the clam queens ride in the giant pan down the main street. So that to me is pretty amazing. But it gets even better when they went to a neighboring town that was famed for chickens and they decided to make a, a giant egg, which isn't super spectacular on its own right. But at one point, the giant pan came to the town with the giant egg and it was still an operating pan. So they got the egg queen from the egg town jumped in the pan with slabs of bacon strapped to her feet and skated around the pan to grease it no. to make the world's largest omelet in the world's <laughs> oh largest God. pan at the site of the world's largest egg. Whoa. So all of these components by themselves are pretty neat, but it's the story that compounds in the region that I think has the super potential to the gestalt of making the whole so much greater than its parts because they're crazy stories that you can't make up, which wouldn't have happened with just the egg or wouldn't have happened with just the pan, but took that magic mm. of bacon feet to tie it all together. 
All this talk of the world's largest omelet raises the big question. Should towns try to set a Guinness World Record with their attraction? That is something to consider as you're building these. For a Guinness certification, it has to be really specific. So if you're building a giant cuckoo clock, it has to be built out of the same materials and function in the same way as a normal sized cuckoo clock, which for roadside attractions isn't always practical. Uh, but there is a town, Casey, Illinois, who has navigated this really well. They decided to be a small town with big things. So they didn't land on one idea. They just create a series of large things. And some of them are going to certified and some of them aren't. But they still embrace both of them. So I don't think that's a driving force anymore. And, and I'm trying to think of how you would make the world's largest muskrat out of muskrats. It doesn't seem very humane. <laughs> yeah, for that one, it would have to be a live trapped muskrat that is the largest. Ooh. And uh, <laughs> a title that would be also very easy to lose. Mm -hmm. I wonder, like, as a practical matter, is it hard to find the artisans, the craftsmen, the, the builders of these very large things? Not so much anymore. So that is the glory of social media is that there is a network of, if it ends up being fiberglass, there is a team that very actively puts up and takes down fiberglass forms. We actually have a very large metal fabrication community around here. Hmm. Um, why it exists in this area, I'm not sure, but um, there are a number of large metal fabricators um, and what that means is skilled artisans um, who mm. are doing this metal fabrication work. Uh, and they're all right here. So I often go towards that side of, well, you know, like, could you make the biggest steel, well, whatever it is, because... The world's largest metal muskrat, obviously. Yeah, right? <laughs> is it right to say that these attractions really boomed in the sort of glory days of the automobile? And so that's, that's kind of how we got here? I think for a lot of them, but there's also those lone eccentrics out there who see maybe the pride in their town flagging and mm. want to do something to pull the community together. So there mm. are ones that are being made today. Uh, the world's largest Czechoslovakian hand-painted egg is just 14 miles south of me in Wilson. Mm. And that was an idea that came out of a Chamber of Commerce dinner that was talking about, oh, we don't have that community pride anymore. Hmm. What would it take? And they had me as a guest speaker. And it was one of those sort of just, hey, what would happen if? And a couple years later, they put up a billboard before they put up the egg saying, coming soon, world's largest hmm. check egg. And then on the day of its arrival, a regional fiberglass manufacturer created it and delivered it to downtown and swung it over the intersection to have its, its place where it would be painted. And it mm. became this whole reminder to the town that, yes, this is cool. Yes, this is awesome. Hmm. That's great. And I'm looking at a picture of it. It's quite attractive, actually. Yeah, it's really well done. Yeah, and huge. It really hmm. was this community on the brink of, do we keep going or mm. do we say, all right, that's it? And they hmm. chose to keep going. That's awesome. So, so it's not like all roadside attractions happened 50 years ago or 100 years ago, that they're, they're still vibrant. There's new ones happening. And I think probably one coming soon mm -hmm. to Smyrna, Delaware. No, I, I think I'm more encouraged. I, I really like the little pieces of, of sort of maybe a couple of the rules that you talked about, Erica. I also really like some of the idea that you don't have to chase like the Guinness piece um, and that idea of authenticity, those I think are things that really resonate very well with me because I, I like the idea of irreverence. And part of me was afraid that I was going to hear from you like, oh yeah, you know, always take whatever it is, the, the, whatever was the biggest industry in your town. And that's the thing that's going to work. Um, and I'm glad that wasn't the answer. Yeah, because there are other towns that had that industry too. So it's mm -hmm. really diving down to... The superlative that might not be the biggest. Yeah. The superlative that might not be the biggest. So there's something that's sort of the essence. Like basically, yeah. you have to distill Smyrna. Mm. 
It sounds like. <laughs> and it sounds like Mike is perfectly primed to do yes, that. Yes, nobody else. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> the right man for the job. <laughs> Thank you to Mike for including us in this brainstorming project. We can't wait to visit Smyrna and try the Scrapple Vodka. Perhaps in the shadow of the world's largest metal muskrat? And a big thank you to Erica for all of her wonderful insights. We'll link to her website, and we're definitely putting Lucas, Kansas on our next road trip itinerary. And what about the rest of you? What's your favorite roadside attraction? Give us a call and let us know at 646-495-4001 or send us a note at howto at slate.com. That's also where you can always reach us when you need help with anything. Building, say, a bigger ball of twine or, I don't know, inventing an alarming flavor of vodka. Whatever it is, we'd love to hear from you. How To's executive producer is Derek John. Rosemary Belson and Kevin Bendis produced this episode. Merritt Jacob is Senior Technical Director. Charles Duhigg created the show. I'm Amanda Ripley. Thanks for listening.